Um, so yeah, hey everyone, uh, welcome to our webinar today. Um, we are going to talk uh, about um, exactly how the struggles and problems as well as challenges um, of young women activists around the world as well as their achievements and celebrate how far um, we've come uh, generally. But we will also look at um, the different challenges of um, uh, that uh, international organizations have faced by um, to get young women uh, to uh, um, work towards uh, CSW uh, 64, which is uh, upcoming, um, which is a key milestone um, in the work that we've done on uh, gender equality and human rights generally. Um, so today with me, we have uh, Shruti Venkatesh, who is a human rights activist and LGBTI uh, plus activist uh, from India. Uh, we have um, Marcial with us, um, who is a human rights activist uh, from Nicaragua, um, as well as uh, Kesa, who is um, part of the youth cluster within Civicus, um, and Georgia Booth, who's been working with Pan International um, as well with uh, youth in advocacy. Um, so I'm not even going to take up too much space, and I want to hand it right over um to the first contribution um so yeah if you um sorry getting lost here a bit uh shruti would you like to give it a head start yeah perfect uh just checking in to see if i'm still visible and audible yes you're visible and audible okay um all right hi everyone my name is shruti venkatesh and i'm a queer rights activist from india i'm currently leading the queer resource center at our organization called one future collective and my work is mainly focused around behavioral change, capacity building, resource development, and also undertaking research in the fields of gender justice and mental health. Uh, before I begin, I'd like to firstly thank Civicus for giving me this wonderful opportunity because I believe that where we stand in the world today, it becomes extremely important for young women's voices to be heard and amplified. So thank you so much Civicus and of course Juliet for reaching out to me. I was also part of their 16 days activism campaign where I was able to speak about my individual struggles as a human rights defender in India. And uh, today, however, for the webinar, I would like to shift that focus and uh, speak about how the queer community in India is being systematically oppressed and of course connected to my various inputs and aspirations ahead of the CSW64. Um, I'd like to start off by highlighting the immediate need for implementing comprehensive sexuality education and sexual and reproductive health and rights awareness from the primary level for all. I think this is particularly significant in the Indian context because there is little to no emphasis on sexuality and gender sensitization at the school level uh, and also the college level. Uh, and this, of course, leads to increase in homophobia transphobia and um, also a general misinformation. I believe that a true struggle for queer rights activists in India is in terms of relentlessly working towards being successful in creating behavioral change and also educating others uh, of the various issues that the community has to face. Yet, uh, we're largely outnumbered by those who are propagating and practicing very harmful patriarchal norms, which severely affect our community as a whole. Secondly, I'd like to um, speak about one of the major issues which the queer community is facing at the moment, and that is about having to work around existing laws because of a lack of direct legal protection. And this is especially true for the transgender community in India. Uh, the transgender community at the moment lacks the right to self-identification and the system also now mandates medical and surgical transitioning, which means that if a person wants to identify as a transgender person, then they have to go through medical transitioning. And as we can imagine, that is an impossibility for many. Um, there is definitely a direct and a clear and, in, uh, and increased marginalization of certain identities, and that's specifically queer women, the trans community, and the Dalit community in India, uh, and of course, uh, persons, queer persons with disabilities. And this is in comparison to others within the broader spectrum of queer identities in the country. 
Next, I'd like to um, mention the need for better protection mechanisms for human rights defenders. Um, of late, there has been an increase in targeted violence against those belonging to marginalized identities. And it becomes extremely important to raise visibility and awareness, as well as condemn such discrimination, uh, specifically one that goes beyond uh, cis women and also involves transgender and non-binary identities. Uh, there's something really interesting and common in India, as well as other South Asian, as well as Southeast Asian countries. And this is very significant to queer lives. And that is the existence of certain non-traditional and non-consanguineous relationships um, around the country. Um, in India specifically, uh, there are trans persons who may belong to community systems. And these systems have people known as gurus. Now, these gurus act as official and sometimes even unofficial guardians. The issue here is that there's a lack of legal recognition of such diverse families and relationships. Um, this can put a lot of people into legal trouble because, um, for an instance, there are many trans women in India who would probably use their guru's name as their father's name in a lot of their legal documentation. But when there's no legal recognition of this, um, then it can even go up to them not being considered uh, citizens because they're not able to show their legal documents and papers that have accurate information. Um, the law is also extremely exclusive. Um, a lot of queer persons in India, and I'm sure that this is a reality for many uh, queer persons and communities across the world as well, are ostracized and removed from their families at very young ages. And of course, this leads to systemic poverty and an increased vulnerability to discriminatory family laws. Uh, for example, in India, um, there is uh, the inheritance laws that exist uh, are quite discriminatory and do not accommodate persons outside the gender binary. And queer persons can also encounter a lot of resistance from relatives, as well as family members who do not accept their sexual orientation or gender identity. And what happens is that a major consequence of this is, of course, that um, queer persons and communities can fall uh, into dire financial trouble. Another issue which um, queer persons are still fighting um, against in India is equal access to healthcare. This is definitely an ongoing battle. Uh, and I would say that there's a very desperate need right now for mandatory sensitization trainings for healthcare staff at all levels, and also a need for queer inclusive infrastructure and an increase in awareness, uh, access, and availability of information in order to ensure queer-friendly healthcare services. And these services should definitely be inclusive of mental health care for queer persons, and very importantly, of course, sexual and reproductive health services. Um, in India, trans and queer folks still experience the highest levels of stigma in healthcare settings and are often sexually harassed as well as examined without their consent and definitely encounter negligence and poor quality services. And in many such similar settings, they are condemned for their sexual preferences and gender identity. This leads to either self-treatment or no treatment at all and delayed, diagno delayed diagnosis and uh, a very low level of awareness. And all of which are, of course, independently very dangerous, as well as when they exist in a combination. Lastly, I'd like to speak about a lack of understanding of what intersectionality is in India. Um, marginalized voices have to be heard in order to accelerate the queer rights movement. I think it's very necessary to shift away from tokenism and be truly inclusive in all regards, especially in policy making spaces where communities like trans folks and the Dalit queer community and persons, queer persons with disabilities and queer women are largely ignored. Um, I'd like to conclude this by mentioning that um, my country right now is going through a lot because of certain recent amendments that have been brought about um, in certain laws. And um, I have to mention that there, the que queer women um, and a lot of fearless young women 
uh, and a lot of courageous trans folks have been at the forefront of um, these mass resistance movements. I'm sure that a lot of you here might have seen or heard or known uh, that there have been widespread protests that are broken, across, uh, broken out across the country um, and the extremely strong ties of unity and solidarity that exist amongst these groups who are also bound by shared struggles. Um, it's definitely been one of the core forces that have guided our fight and given them that courage to be at the forefront. So yeah. Perfect. Thank you so much for your contribution, Shakti. It sounds super, super interesting. Um, cool. So I would like to hand over to um, Maciel, um, who is, as already mentioned, a human rights activist from Nicaragua. Uh, Maciel will be presenting in uh, Spanish, but I will be posting uh, the translation of what she's been saying uh, in the group chat on the side. So Maciel, si quieres uh, comenzar, empezar, sí. <laughs> Hola. Otra vez, eh, buenos días, un gusto conocerlas. Y bueno, eh, mi nombre es Judith Maciel Castillo Corea. Tengo 19 años de edad y soy parte de la Asociación Movimiento de Mujeres por Nuestros Derechos Humanos, MOMU. Eh, bueno, eh, me gustaría, antes de empezar en toda la actividad que hemos tenido, o sea, mi formación como, como activista, eh, yo tengo cinco años de ser parte. De, de esta asociación de mujeres que nos centramos en ayudar a niñas y adolescentes en, con respecto a abusos sexuales y violación en, en, todo, en todos sus aspectos. Eh, bueno, antes de, de iniciarme en, en esto, eh, yo tuve una adolescencia un poquito difícil porque <coughs> vivía con mi mamá, mi papá y mi hermano. Y mi papá era un, un poquito violento, sí, lo era, machista. Y bueno, como acá en Nicaragua se acostumbra a que lo que dice el hombre, eso es. Entonces, era lo que pasaba en mi casa. Mi papá decía cualquier cosa y uno tenía que, que hacer lo que él decía. Y bueno, <coughs> permitía, como les comento, que mi papá me gritara, que muchas veces me pegara. Tal vez por, porque yo nunca he sido... La típica niña que, que le gusta hacer lo que otros dicen. Siempre me ha gustado tener mis iniciativas propias. Me gusta eh, moverme, ayudar a otras niñas. O sea, no me gusta quedarme callada eh, con respecto a, a mis derechos y eso. Y bueno, cuando eh, Yanira eh, la conocí, ella me comentó que era activista en, en este movimiento. Y la verdad es que a mí me interesó mucho porque siempre me ha gustado ayudar a otras niñas y eso. Y entonces empecé como un miembro más, siempre con pena, porque es lo normal al ver a otras niñas que yo no conocía, otras chavalas. Y entonces eh, fui aprendiendo sobre mis derechos, autocuidado, lo que valemos y todo. Entonces, después de estos cinco años que tuve como, como formación, ahora que soy activista, hago lo mismo con otras niñas que tienen problemas similares con, con su familia, que son violentadas. Entonces, nosotras damos seguimiento, las traemos, que forman parte, que aprendan sobre sus derechos, les enseñamos autocuidado. Eh, trabajamos con niñas, con las niñas se eh, trabaja un poquito una metodología diferente, por lo que son más pequeñas. Entonces, y no, no queremos que, que se aburran, que les cuesta entender un poquito. Entonces nosotros llevamos a cabo lo que es la piñata de la no violencia. Es una metodología de aprender jugando, así, así la llamamos. Entonces, eh, la piñata de la no violencia, si quieren les explico un poquito en qué consiste. Eh, bueno, se hace, nosotras elaboramos unas piñatas que les colgamos una cinta. Entonces las niñas cogen una cinta cada una y bailan, y ríen alrededor de la piñata hasta que se forma como con un tipo de trenza que se va enredando y luego en lugar de golpearla como normalmente se hace, entonces solo se jalan y caen todos los caramelos. Entonces luego nosotros hacemos una pequeña reflexión de, de qué les pareció, cuál es lo diferente, entonces ella ya no, nos comenta de que no se le golpea. Entonces lo que nosotras queremos es que ella aprenda que cuando quiere algo, cuando te gusta algo, no se le golpea, no se le violenta. Que normalmente lo que se suele hacer aquí es que la figurita que más le gusta a ella, 
entonces es de lo que se hace la piñata. Entonces les, siento yo que les estás enseñando de que lo que se quiere se golpea. Entonces eso es lo que nosotros estamos ahí trabajando con eso, que se les vaya quitando esa idea de que me pega porque me quiere. También eh, eh, soy asesora en cuestión de, de casos de, de violencia. Hace poco tuvimos un problema con una niña de abuso sexual y entonces nosotros le dimos seguimiento con la abogada y todo y pues se eh, logró resolver. Y también de, de pensión alimenticia, damos apoyo en ese aspecto. Bueno, yo en la actualidad soy estudiante. Estudio en una universidad que se llama UNAM, aquí en Nicaragua es una universidad pública. Y bueno, yo estudio relaciones internacionales y la cuestión de los derechos. Sí, conozco un poco acerca de los derechos humanos, entonces eso me ayuda a mí para poder dar seguimiento y apoyo a estas niñas. Y bueno, en el contexto actual que está pasando en nuestro país, uh, de el 2018 a la actualidad, hemos tenido problemas en seguir con, con estas ayudas, pero eso no nos ha frenado. Lo que tuvimos que hacer fue cerrar las páginas públicas de redes sociales de la organización por, por miedo, porque ahí está el asedio siempre, la policía está detrás de todos estos eh, movimientos, porque según ellos están en contra del gobierno, y entonces tuvimos que cerrar en ese aspecto. Las actividades que hacíamos eh, eh, al aire libre y esas cosas, hemos tratado un poquito de, de frenarlas, estamos trabajando más que todo, en, en nuestro local que tenemos como, como asociación por miedo de que nos vaya a pasar algo. Pero seguimos trabajando. Aquí seguimos con las niñas, ¿no? Con las niñas y adolescentes que necesitan nuestra ayuda. Y, y aunque la situación en el país esté un poquito difícil, no, no vamos a, a parar. Vamos a seguir porque queremos que la sociedad deje de normalizar la violencia. Aquí en Nicaragua es súper común que mires a una pareja eh, peleando, agrediéndose y nadie se mete porque lo que se cree es que son cosas de pareja y ellos lo deben resolver. Y no debe ser así. Aquí han habido muchísimos casos de femicidio. En lo que va del año han habido muchísimos casos de niñas que han sido violadas y asesinadas y eso tiene que parar. Tenemos que, queremos dejar de tener miedo de salir a las calles sin miedo que no podamos regresar, que nos vayan a, que nos vayan a hacer algo. Y debe parar eso. Queremos que las niñas... Dejen de sentir miedo. Por ejemplo, yo tengo una, una, una primita que a ella le da miedo salir porque por lo mismo, por la situación que está pasando el país, no hay apoyo por parte de, de la policía, no hacen nada. En realidad los abusadores siguen ahí afuera y, y nadie hace nada. Entonces nosotras estamos incidiendo en esa parte, queremos que eso se cambie. Estamos ahí luchando y luchando para que nuestros derechos valgan para que se nos respete como, como mujer, como, como persona. Y esto siento yo que solo lo vamos a lograr si estamos trabajando en conjunto todas, en todas las organizaciones. Eh, podemos creer que somos organizaciones distintas, pero en realidad no, todas buscamos el mismo fin. Buscamos que las niñas, la, la adolescentes, las mujeres, tengamos la libertad que siempre hemos querido, que se nos respete nuestra integridad, que vayamos por la calle sin miedo a que alguien nos vaya a faltar el respeto, que nos vaya a hacer daño. Y solo eso lo vamos a lograr así, trabajando en conjunto siempre, apoyándonos y haciendo algo en la sociedad, trabajando ahí porque es en la sociedad en la que está todo, todo el problema. Hay que cambiar esa mentalidad y en nuestro país que ha sido muy difícil, es un país algo tradicional que siempre se ha creído que el hombre es el que debe llevar las riendas y esas cosas. Entonces estamos trabajando en eso. Eh, y ahí estamos. Por ejemplo, yo como persona estoy ahí, está mal, que necesita ayuda. Yo vengo y se los comunico a las otras muchachas de la asociación y entonces le damos seguimiento y ahí estamos siempre. Y es lo que vamos a seguir haciendo. Muchas gracias, Marcial. Um, yes, I guess I will, I will get more translation up um, soon. Unfortunately, my life translation um, to Spanish is not perfect. <laughs> uh, but I will definitely put that in the comments later on. Um, 
thanks so much. So uh, next, actually, Kessa, if uh, you could talk a bit more about the work that Civicus is doing um, amongst GSW and uh, with uh, young women activists, actually. Thanks, Juliet, and uh, thanks, uh, Shruti and um, Maciel. I wish I could have like heard um, all of that, but unfortunately, um, my Spanish is uh, not there at all. But um, I can tell that what you were sharing really sounded um, quite personal and quite heartbreaking. That your activism really is stems from. Um, the personal experiences that um, you've had. But yeah, my name is uh, Gesa Obaka, Paratlati, everyone calls me Gesa. I work for Civicus as a Youth Community Building Officer. And um, in the youth team, really, um, amongst one of the main things that we do amongst our work is to make sure that we actually resource young people, young women specifically, um, young women who are doing really incredible things um, in their communities, um, in the grassroots. Um, and by supporting them or resourcing them, it's not just um, financially like giving them money, but we make sure that we actually give them technical support in terms of um, trainings and capacity building so that um, they can acquire the skills that they need to actually amplify the impact that they are already doing in their communities but we also try to give them access to spaces where they can actually share um, the work that they're doing um, and network and meet with other stakeholders um, and influencers within that space that can actually be like they can partner with and um, they can advance the work that uh, they're already doing we try to give them mentorship and connect them with mentors who can guide them and help them along their personal journey as well so that they are able to deliver on some of the important outcomes of the projects that they're already doing. So um, one of the ways in which we actually do this and uh, what most of my work really is all about at the moment is called the Goalkeepers Youth Action Accelerator Project. And through this project, we do exactly what I just mentioned. We are funding young people who are really doing incredible things that are related to the SDGs, especially SDGs 1 to 6 that are based in the Global South, in Africa, in Latin America, and in Asia. And um, some of our youth advocates are actually doing projects that are related directly with um, SDG 5, which is advanced in gender equality and in a way that also links to SDG 3 as well, which is health. We actually have three of our youth advocates who will be going to CSW in March. Um, one is actually advocating for LGBTQI rights in Botswana. Um, the other is from India. Shruti, and I can also make this connection as well. What she's doing is that she is trying to fight against stigma um, that basically is associated with unmarried women in India when they're trying to access health services, especially that are related to sexual um, reproductive health. And then we have another incredible young lady who is from Ghana, who is also working on sexual reproductive health, ensuring that there's access to information and services for out-of-school teens, and also fighting against um, child marriage in the rural parts of Ghana as well. And we are ensuring that we support the participation through technical support. So this is through logistics, just making sure that they have all that they need to be able to gain access to this space and actually share their experiences and their challenges and also get to connect with um, other NGOs and other young activists who are also doing similar work. Um, there's another interesting project that the youth team is actually be working on at the moment. It's quite new. Uh, some of my colleagues are in Jordan right now shortlisting um, applications. So it's called the Youth Action Lab. And this one is really directed to working with young people who are, you know, who are from the grassroots who don't or wouldn't normally get support from traditional uh, mainstream 
civil society organizations, um, maybe because they don't know the necessary language, they don't have enough visibility, or they just um, don't fulfill the criteria that is usually expected or asked from young activists who are doing incredible things, but unfortunately just do not have access to such spaces. And um, I actually engaged with some of the youth advocates who will be going to CSW to try to find out what is it exactly that you are hoping to see in terms of the outcomes for um, this convening, this event. And it's very clear from the feedback that they really just don't want tokenistic representation, more like what Shruti mentioned earlier that you know, sometimes you find young people, young women are actually invited to these spaces, but are they actually given access, true access to be heard, to share their experiences, to share their views, to intervene. Um, and even when they do, what actually does come out of the, what they share, is it just to represent and to give us to say, no, we had a young person on this panel. But what they want to see is that what they actually share is actually taken back and it is translated into actionable, actionable um, interventions that the gatekeepers of power, that the leaders that will be there um, will go back home and say, you know what, we need to do this to actually advance gender equality and make sure that it has, has an impact on young women who are working in the communities, um, in the grassroots, who maybe are cut off from accessing spaces like CSW because nobody has, not everybody has the means to actually um, make it to New York and actually um, engage with these stakeholders, even though what they're doing is really incredible work. So what they want to see is to ensure that what is shared actually goes back home and is uh, translated into actions that actually advance the CG5, which is gender equality. But more especially for the governments to not just make commitments on these panels, in word, but to actually invest resources and money um, into developing programs and interventions in their own countries that actually ensure that there's greater women participation, that women are brought into leadership, that they actually have a say and meaningful uh, participation when it comes to designing some of these interventions and development plans to actually advance this cause. So that is from the youth team from Silicus and uh, thanks Juliet. Thanks so much for sharing Kessa. Um, cool, so um, we're heading off to our final contribution um, already, time is flying. Uh, Georgia, would you like to take the floor? Sure. Um, so I had a presentation but I can probably just do it verbally um so that we can keep seeing each other because it's not very long um wait maybe if i can let me see but yeah um i can't honestly verbally is probably fine okay, as well cool. <laughs> right, um thanks. so hi everyone i'm georgia the head of youth advocacy and activism at plan international um so i joined plan about two and a half years ago to help design our youth-led collective action strategy which is called powering the movement um, so as an INGO, we're reflecting on our role in supporting girl and youth-led movements for gender equality and feminism. Um, and this strategy encompasses that and provides guidance for our organization. Some of our offices have been doing this work for many years and for others it's quite new. Um, so I'm here to tell you a little bit about our plans for CSW and specifically how we're supporting girl-led advocacy um, and spotlighting the work we're doing on youth funding. So CSW is an important moment for us this year in particular um, because it's a key part of the Beijing Plus 25 process of which we're, we're quite heavily involved. Um, it's an opportunity for supporting girl-led advocacy and it's a partnership and networking opportunity for us as well. Um, and so this year we're supporting about 10 youth advocates, four of which are adolescent girls um, from I think four or five countries now. So we really try and support those who haven't had this opportunity before um, and use a take two approach. So trying to support perhaps one, because we found that with um, peer selection approaches, um, you often get the best speaker or um, the young person who's traveled before, so they have lots of experience and um, they're often more confident. 
we really want to celebrate that, but we also want to share the opportunities with others. So um, for peer support, we try and support two, um, two young people from each country. If they're under 18, that's a real, that's a definite must for us. They have to have two. Um, and we try and do, you know, one can be a little bit more experienced. We still say they shouldn't have traveled internationally before if possible. Um, but then, um, but maybe they have been a bit more active um, in their countries. And then one who is, is, has less experience, but maybe is doing more community organizing work. And um, so we're really excited for the young people coming this year. Um, the group will have an orientation over the, the first weekend of CSW to prepare them. And they're all part of briefing calls in the run up as well. Um, and each one has a tailored program depending on the focus of their advocacy or organizing back home um, and a few of them have come because they're part of consultations we're doing as part of Beijing so as I said that's kind of one of the main reasons we're there this year because it's a big moment for the Beijing plus 25 process so plan has been facilitating consultations with adolescent girls specifically so that's um, specifically with 14 to 18 year olds in 10 countries to capture their understanding of the Beijing Platform for Action and get their reflections on it and where and how progress is going. Um, and so, and together from that, from those consultations which are happening like right now, we'll be developing um, recommendations from those girls about what remains to be done and using this in our, um, in our advocacy um, throughout the process, throughout this year and beyond. And so, um, at CSW specifically, we're supporting girls who were part of that consultation to come and be part of that. And so we have a specific event and then we, they will also be part of bilateral meetings with um, ministers or ambassadors from their country, with other partners um, and them and the girls from each country who've been involved in consultations will be supported to continue to be part of the process. So they're all from either a program that we're running or a partnership that we have with a youth group. Or network so that we can ensure that there is ongoing engagement um, that goes past the general assembly and really looks towards the action coalitions that are being formed to take forward the work um, and we have like i said we do have one one event which is um i think it's taking place on the 10th of march so if anyone from this group is going to csw or knows anyone who's going i can share the invitation um, we also, as I said, it's also an opportunity for partnership and network building for us. Um, really more focused around the work that I'm doing. So looking at how, at um, more broadly to the sector about how we can, as an organization, understand and support and partner with youth groups and networks and movements. So we have an event on the 12th of March, um, which is um, called Diverse and Powerful Girls and Self-Organizing for Change. So we've been supporting um, or working with uh, young feminist groups in Latin America and Africa and Asia um, to design a self-organizing tool, so a how-to guide for young feminist activists. Mainly, it was initially targeting um, teenage girl activists. Uh, we wanted it to definitely be accessible for them, but it could also be used more widely by youth, by youth groups more widely. So that's an event that we have on March 12th. And then um, we're also, as an organization, exploring our role and our power within the feminist funding ecosystem and the gender equality funding ecosystem. So we're also holding a roundtable discussion on TVC date, either the 9th or the 11th. Um, and this will be to share a live demo of a new youth funding web app that we've been working on with we co designed with youth activists in Guatemala and in Brazil. Um, and it will be a dialogue between funders and partners and youth activists as well. And lastly, we'll have a self-care meetup. So a few, me and some colleagues from, colleagues and friends from the UN Girls Education Initiative and from Amnesty was at the first one and, um, and from Africa Youth Movement, we've started coming together informally to explore self-care and collective self-care and what care and what that means for us super informal so we're going to have a meetup in csw for whoever's there so if anyone is interested i can share more information about that um it'll probably be in some cafe somewhere like really really informal uh, and we're kind of thinking it will be you know what does self-care and collective care look like in the csw space um and then lastly i think just some reflections on some of the challenges um 
that we've seen, like the challenges, not the pros and cons, but kind of the pros and cons of engaging and supporting young people and the girls to be part of this space. Um, some of the challenges are the closing space for, for them, just the limited space for um, civil society organizations anyway, let alone youth groups, let alone informal girl or youth groups. So just the kind of lack of, of formal space there anyway. Um, the other thing that we've we noticed is visa challenges. So, you know, there are often opportunities coming up um, to, you know, to engage young people and, and girls in meetings or events, um, but with like two weeks run in time and or like a month run in time even. And so there's just not enough time to get visas. And then we find that where, you know, you would end up supporting the same people over and over again because they have a passport already and a visa already. And, um, and so visa challenges is a real challenge is a real challenge for us, um, particularly when we're looking at the at the UN space in New York. Um, and that kind of brings on to my point that it's not always the most diverse groups at CSW. Um, I think it's getting better. Um, and like I said, we really, really try and support and, and not bring the same people over and over again and try and not bring the most well-established youth activists that we work with um, but try and bring a diverse group and share those opportunities. Um, another challenge is how meaningful it is and I think this um, I think yeah everyone can attest to that that it's um, particularly if it's engagement in the formal UN space it's often it's still a very adult-led adult-centric space um, and so there's still sort of there might be opportunities to like slot a five-minute speech for a young person but it's not you know, there's no kind of co-design or youth-led aspect to it, as far as we can tell, and we're um, we're hoping that's changing, um, and we're sort of pushing it to change as well. And like I said, we see shifts here and there, but it is a difficult thing for us. Um, and then some of, but like, but we do keep doing it, and we do keep supporting girls and young people to engage, and we as Plan keep engaging because it is an awesome opportunity for advocating and, and influencing. It's also an amazing space for networking and partnership building and it's my it's one of the um the incredible parts i think for me is is making sure that you build enough time for any any young people who are coming to be able to meet others and build that and have that that time to build connections and and soak it all in um and we're seeing um a growing feminist solidarity space so the self-care meetup is an example i know um you know friends of mine um colleagues of mine through the UN Girls Education Initiative and UNFPA and, and CAT calls are, you know, have been creating feminist cafe spaces, which I think is a really awesome thing. So we're seeing this kind of growing feminist solidarity space there too, which is really positive. Um, so yeah, that's an overview from me. I'll hand back over to you now and open to any questions if there are any. Perfect. Thank you so much, uh, Georgia. Um, yeah, so um, that's it from the different contributions from uh, our panel lists. Um, so I was wondering if any of you have any questions, comments, concerns, anything? Otherwise I do, just saying. Um, I just have uh, one question for Georgia, or maybe just uh, advice. Um, firstly, you are right about the visa um, challenge because we actually had um, a fourth participant that was supposed to go to CSW but uh, because from that from Nigeria and there's this new travel ban you know they uh, just um, yeah they had to pull out of the out of making the trip which is really unfortunate because they're also doing really incredible work as well in Nigeria but um, I'm interested in knowing what are some of the strategies um, that Plan actually uses to connect some of these young activists when they go for such international convenings to their national delegations, especially from the government, um, so that of course when they go back home, they're able to continue um, and partner and actually like uh, amplify probably the work that they're doing with the support of their governments. Because last year when we actually took our goalkeepers to uh, UNGA, uh, it was something that we really struggle a lot. Um, with achieving and I'd be interested to know how you've been successful in being able to set that up for the young women activists that are going to CSW. Sure, um, so I'll use an example that we from a few years ago and it was actually when 
I was on, I was working for a different organization in partnership with PLAN. Um, and it was a coalition of, of organizations advocating for girls and girls' rights and needs to be embedded in the sustainable development goals. This is back in like 2014 and 15. And um, it, there was a, we did, we in our organization and PLAN and, and the others in the coalition did a lot of work to, um, to support it was it was all adolescent girls as well to be engaging in they were all doing some sort of community level organizing um you know and that was and they had organically started doing that and, and connecting with groups in their community um and whether it's through program or partnership we would support them to connect with national level groups and networks and build their capacity um, around national level advocacy so that was the kind of starting point that they were sort of and sort of building level by level um, so engaging them in the design of national level advocacy strategies, um, building their capacity to be able to engage with and talk to decision makers at the national level. Um, and then this, and all, all with a focus on, on the SDGs and then, um, supporting them to, or you know, supporting represent, representatives from the group, those groups to engage, um, in the UN space. And so we would organize bilateral meetings. Um, we would try to co-organize events with member states where possible. That was that can be tricky, <laughs> um, but at least bilateral meetings with um, with the, with their missions um, and really supporting them with communications training um, to develop their key messages uh, and their recommendations. Very much there as not plans, um, and then um, would follow up and sort of again we would we would do kind of tactical things so we had um, this was all part of a project called the girl declaration so we had girl declaration bracelets and it was things like putting bracelets on your ambassador and getting him or her to commit to following up at home and you know and taking a picture of that so you just try and capture any form of commitment and then when we um and doing a lot of work with, through social media and through our media team as well um, and then following up with that on the way home so it was kind of from community or local to to up to um national level and then global and then following it up back home as well and any kind of commitment that was made um we would really like stick to it and be like you said this we're having a meeting when we go home <laughs> you know you said you can meet with the minister she, you said she could meet with them she's meeting with the minister when she gets home um and we were also and that was very targeted with a certain number of countries as well so it was a very kind of strategic um global influencing program i guess um, but that worked well and we still we still do that and really ensuring to where possible to have bilateral meetings if you have an event um, and you have a young person coming from Botswana you know if appropriate and if it's strategic calling up you know sending an invitation to the mission and then just calling them I spent a lot of my time just on the phones calling and being like that invitation's with you have you seen it have you seen it yet <laughs> um, which really does work people people respond to it um, so yeah some a lot of kind of direct lobby of, of missions and then being really clear about following up and supporting the young person to be following up as well. Cool. Um, Thank you for that. <laughs> yes. Um, so anybody else have any questions? Okay. Um, so I was wondering uh, specifically to make the link um, between the contributions that we had from Kessa and Georgia and Shruti and Maciel um, is to hear from Shruti and Maciel um, what do you think are the lessons that you want organizations like Plan International and Civicus to share during CSW? I Maciel voy a traducir en, uh, en español, um, o oh, tentar de traducir. Uh, ¿Qué piensas en las... Uh, las Como se dice las... Okay, Georgia, I probably need your help here. <laughs> Say that again, what's the question? Um, what they think are the main important um, things and lessons that uh, organizations like Civicus and Plan International need to take to CSW. Okay, um, ¿cuáles son los, las recomendaciones más importantes que organizaciones como Plan o Civicus, nosotros tenemos que traer las recomendaciones a, C a CSW, a Nueva York. ¿Cuáles recomendaciones tienes para nosotros, nuestras organizaciones? Um, ok. 
eh, nosotros como organizaciones, la recomendación que le podemos eh, dar es que sigamos, sigamos ahí en la lucha, eh, apoyando a más niñas, abriendo más espacios, porque en el mundo hay muchísimos niños que necesitan, muchas niñas que están en, en violencia, y creo que eh, no todas tenemos la oportunidad de, de formar parte de espacios como estos, de, de tener estos conocimientos, de que venga alguien y nos diga, mira, esto que te están haciendo está mal, vos tenés estos derechos, eh, tu vida puede cambiar. Entonces hay muchos niños, por ejemplo, aquí en Caragua, hay muchísimos niños en, en, en pobreza, en, en violencia, no van a la escuela, eh, los padres los mandan a trabajar y, y esas cosas. Entonces, eh, mi, mi recomendación es que, que, que se siga trabajando, que se siga integrando a más niñas, eh, se les brinde educación, apoyo psicológico, apoyo legal, eh, amor, que se les dé mucho amor, que ellas sientan de que no están solas, que hay otras personas que quieren ayudar y que, que, que no tengan miedo, que no todas las personas son iguales, no todas son malas. Y eso, enseñarle a las niñas de que no se queden calladas, que si alguien está haciendo daño, que lo digan, que le digan a sus papás, a un amigo, a alguien que, que vean, que sientan confianza y que les pueda ayudar. Porque nunca estamos solas, siempre hay alguien que, que nos está ayudando. Entonces, esa parte que, que se trabaje más, que, que se profundice más con, con, con las niñas, que se abran más espacios para que ellas puedan interactuar y vayan aprendiendo más. So um Maciel said um continue to follow us and support us continue to open these spaces um not everyone has the opportunity to join them um so thinking of the many girls in poverty in Nicaragua um continue to work with them and raise their voices those you know and um and many girls without confidence so continuing to include them perfect thanks for that translation um, wonderful. Uh, Shruti, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, definitely. Uh, firstly, I'd really like to, um, you know, I'd really appreciate what uh, both Kessa and Georgia mentioned. And it's fantastic that um, there's a focus on the younger girls from 14 to 18 who do not, who have never traveled before and, um, you know, do not find spaces at these tables. So um, I'm so happy to know um, the kind of work that's happening. Um, just in terms of the question, um, I think uh, one of the things that I'd like to mention is that there needs to be a highlight uh, of the very unique struggles that exist in the certain micro communities that I had uh, mentioned before as well. And uh, I've been a part of a lot of spaces which, um, you know, as we mentioned, we spoke about tokenism. Um, do not aren't really intersectional in nature, and uh, we need to speak about um, you know the identities that are way more marginalized and do not really find visibility in many spaces. Um, and it's it's something that they truly deserve at the moment because uh, of the kind of oppression that they go through. Um, so I think uh, raising visibility and awareness of uh, the various issues that they face and the lack of rights um that that they have and uh, the consequences of that on their day-to-day -day lives uh, i think i would love to see uh, these kind of things come up um, in such cases cool thank you so much um and then my final question is uh to georgia as well as kessa um talking you both mentioned the struggles of getting visas getting uh people over to uh, the un spaces that um are from countries that are more seen as problematic by other countries uh, to receive visas and to be allowed into those kind of spaces. Um, so how do you how do you think we can address that challenge and still try to guarantee that diversity that we're looking for um, and open up spaces for, for people that do not have the resources and possibilities to afford the flight tickets um, to head over to, to New York or, or Geneva? Is that do you want to go or I could? I can go first. So I was just sending a translation to Marcial. So this question about 
um, how can we better, how can we continue to support the most marginalized, especially those without visas, and ensure that kind of diverse representation in these spaces? That was my understanding. Yeah, um, I think being really intentional about it, because even at PLAM, we sometimes struggle and we say we want to do this. And then um, if an opportunity comes up last minute, we sometimes might just um, still go for the opportunity, even if we know that means um, uh, that we're putting at risk our principle and our commitment to supporting diversity. So I'm becoming much firmer on it uh, and just saying, starting to say no to things, um, starting to say no to organizers and feedback to organizers, including those within UN agencies to say, um, you know, no, we can't bring someone, no, we can't support someone to be here because you haven't given us enough time. Um, next time, if you want to, we would love to, but you have to support us to do that. Um, I think it's an, it's something that PLAN continues to do as well, just in terms of the resourcing part is, um, is again, like trying to, trying to bring as diverse a group as possible. So some, we often, so in the countries where we work, we have, um, we have sometimes program interventions, but sometimes we also have partnerships, um, in a country or in a community um with a girl or youth-led organization so we also try and support them to join um, and might pay for them to participate in in a, in a space like this so um trying to bring some youth partners as well as the young people who are part of a program um, and the other this lastly on the visas in terms of pre preparing we just have like quite a stringent like process so we try and do three to six months in advance like i said we have lots of these kind of policies and processes around how we can support meaningful engagement and um, how much run-in time we have to prep. But the run-in time, yes, is about preparing them for the events and, and their engagement, but it's also about making sure they have enough time to get a passport and a visa and budgeting properly for that and budgeting for country staff to be able to support them to do that, to go to the embassy, to fill out forms, um, to be able to get their parent consent. Um, so it's a lot, it's a big deal and it's a big, um, it's a big deal to be able to support um, support that process, particularly when you need to get passports and visas. But for us, it's worthwhile. Um, and again, it's sort of if we have colleagues or offices who want to support global level advocacy or girl advocacy, we part of my job is just reminding them that it's the cost. So yes, that's great, but have you budgeted for it properly, and have you left enough time? Um, because you can't do it on a on a shoestring. Um, at least not with the safeguarding policies and processes we have in place. Um, we'd rather do it really, really well um, than, and we'd rather do it not at all um, if we can't do it really, really well. So that's some of the things that we do um, that, and you know, sometimes last minute, honestly, it's, it's calling up people we know who might have contacts and friends in different embassies and calling out favors. That's honestly sometimes what it comes down to. I mean, we've had visa rejections is really kind of reaching out through our networks for support um, and we've been able to support others doing that as well which we're always really happy to do when we can thanks so much Kessa. do you have anything to add yeah i think um maybe just two points one is that you know advocacy always works so continue advocating and just um, really calling for more meaningful diversity and inclusion, especially of groups that are excluded and marginalized. I think one thing that Civicus is really doing well is on really re taking a lead on resourcing informal um, youth movements, youth groups, young activists, young advocates, I mean with the different projects that it has at the moment. Um, this is really commendable. Um, but I think governments are still really lagging behind um, when it comes to this and they really do need to join and or support CSOs and NGOs who are actually um, doing incredible work on this front. So, yeah, we just shouldn't stop. Keep advocating, keep uh, campaigning for changing the should be it will happen. Wonderful, thank you so much. Um, is there any other questions from anyone that's around? 
I see no hands risen. Cool, perfect. Um, then I would like to, to thank all of you, um, especially Shruti, Marcel, Georgia, and Kessa for having participated. Sorry, there's just, there's one comment from Marcel, oh. I just realized. Oh yeah, <laughs> go ahead, read it. Um, she said, hi, um, yes, we have to focus on rural communities. Um, uh, let me just see, make this bigger. My eyesight is going. <laughs> <laughs> we need to... Um, there are more rural co communities in Nicaragua, therefore it is the girls um, from the communities we work with. Um, so they do some work doing um, like emotional support to, for, I think for victims or survivors, um, to have a strong voice and to be an actor, so they, or like capacity building and support, um, so that they have the voice to fight for their rights and not let them be violated. I think that's a really good point. It's, that's something we've noticed as well. It's if we are advocating for um, to change what you know for on child marriage, for example, in the global space, um, we really try and support um, girls or young people who are directly affected by that and have personal motivation and are genuinely doing advocacy on that at the local level. But it's beneficial to them as well, and so that it gives them so that they can be at the forefront of the fight. Um, and support them to do that rather than trying to speak on their behalf. Gracias, Maciel. <laughs> cool, wonderful. Um, any other questions or comments? Algunas preguntas o comentarios? Comentarios? Hello. Hi, everyone. Hi, how are you doing? My sincerest apologies for having been late. We had a different um, meeting just now. Um, I think for me, I just really just wanted to share, I hope Kessa shared some of my um, objectives. Yes, no? For to me. Oh, thank you. Yes, <laughs> just thinking. Well. So, yeah. Um, so I think, I mean, I mean, just sharing from some of the experiences before, especially under the goalkeepers program around the HLPF and, you know, UNGA and so forth. Um, I think the fact that there's like, I mean, you know, UN Women has been really quite um, trans. Not, not not transparent, but really very intentional in communicating, you know, the roadmap, um, particularly around Beijing Plus 25. And I think for me, the real value is in the engagement. And I'm not sure if others are aware of NGO CSW. What? Yeah, NGO CSW, um, which obviously um, is like the civil society sort of a representative arm that has been helping a lot of people, um, particularly with the toolkit around um, the shadow reporting, and um, even like now, where it was like speaking engagements, something like that. So I think you know the the the. the about three things that for me I would sort of um, take keen interest on and then the first uh, is that um, the women's major group has got like a, a events maybe someone might have already mentioned it but then has got like an events um, excel sheet somewhat excel sheet except that you know there aren't as many RSVPs that are available now I think like side events and you know programmatic things are still uh, a work in progress which is a little bit of a surprise given that you know we're just a few weeks away from it so I think for me taking advantage of that and then being able to strategize around some of some key events um, is like really meaningful. And then um, just a the second point is the fact that, you know, in terms of a lot of engagement, um, I think they, you know, with, with this upcoming session and the fact that so many civil society organizations have been quite proactive, especially even when it came to like, you know, challenging, you know, the composition of like the civil society constituents in the CS, in the, in the, in the Beijing Plus 25 process and so forth. I think for me, that means that there's space for people to be, you know, especially presenting issues of diversity um, and sort of just trying to advance whatever interests are needed. Um, you know, on that point, for me, what is really key is documenting, you know, that intervention um, and being strategic enough to make sure, um, you know, you're in a space where there is like, whether it's live streaming or whether it's like the UN uh, TV, you know, so that it's something that someone can use when they go back home. Because in many instances, when you try and have conversations, sometimes so much more easier when you're able to like plug in a link or whatever um, that actually can showcase your presence there. And then just thirdly, um, it's really around, um, I think I've realized that it's very, very difficult, 
you know, especially when you are engaging or questioning some processes or issues or like, let's say, policy positions, knowing full well, like, I think with the, with the, with the process around the political declaration and universal health coverage, you know, so many things that would be considered diverse and progressive were obviously um, eliminated or they were prevented or removed at some point in the process. And so when you as an advocate are there, you know, and trying to advance it, whether it's with a key, you know, data specialist or it's, or it's with someone who's actually working um, or who's from a panel, you can realize very quickly that um, there is a fear of sort of politicizing um, either the event or the narratives or, or the content that's being presented. Um, it sort of defeats the purpose because when a member state is there and, you know, is presenting their own position or opposing it, like previously with the multidimensional poverty index, it then becomes a bit more political. So um, I think it's a bit of a sensitive area because, you know, for networking possibilities, I have found that, you know, it's a lot more difficult in those spaces because sometimes you're not really aware if it's, you know, someone is more interested in meeting, you know, the leaders who can either advance their careers or their INGOs or it's just a case of um, the fact that we have a very set you know, policy position and wouldn't want to entertain further. I think for me, it's just realizing that um, it's really more about networking and it's really more about you know, exploring you know, an alternative platform like, um, you know, usually you know, there's like a people's assembly or ground level um, people's um, uh, assembly. So, I mean, there are always alternative spaces, which I think are really quite key you know around the csw that are a lot more meaningful and where you can really get some of those positions unlike you know the obviously restricted space at the headquarters for instance so but i think that there are many avenues definitely for engagement and i think you know, just un women has been really quite i think intentional in being a bit more open um and and so i think this you know the, the, those two weeks will re really be a lot more worthwhile compared to let's say the general assembly just my two cents Cool, thanks so much for that, for that add-on. Uh, is there anybody uh, who wants to respond to that? Okay, cool. Um, all right, thanks, Dumi. Um, and thanks to, to everyone who's made it out today. Um, thank you to Shruti, Maciel, Kesa, and Georgia for your marvelous contributions um, and for all the learnings that we, that we were able to, to do today. Um, so I'm very, very excited to see what's uh, finally going to happen at CSW. I'm excited to hear uh, what is going to be taken on, um, what is going to continue. And um, yeah, so thank you so much for coming out. Uh, thank you so much for participating and um, wishing all of you a wonderful day. Thank you thank so you. much, Juliet. Yeah, thank you, everyone. And all Congrats the other panelists, thank you.